Can, can anyone confirm that I'm still um, back somewhat? Okay. So, I think I'm back, right? Zoom people? Cool. Uh, I, need to, I need to share something. Hang on. Um, else you see me. Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> yes, um, that's right. So, let's see. It asked me to recover the video recordings, which is great. So let's see if we can actually do that. So here's the TV. I'm uh, right. The camera turn the camera to well. Um, actually, yes. So I turn it slightly there, but you should see the screen now as well. Even though you will not be able to nicely read it on the PowerPoint on this screen there. So okay, let's see how it goes. Um, first of all, um, let's pray all that doesn't happen again. Uh, second of all, let's continue whatever we did here right now. Okay, REST specifications. So IFCs we learned. Uh, IFCs, what does it stand for? Good, ah, good, short-term memory works. So uh, now we're working back on long-term memory. Um, so uh, where is the specification happening? IETF, and I was asking for another standardization committee that you may have heard of. Okay, oh, there you go, yeah. What does that thing do? W, okay, W3C, right? So um, that's like the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, right? It's kind of a weird acronym, the three stands for dub, dub, dub. So, um, and they are responsible for web standards primarily. Web, that means uh, really like um, everything that builds on top of HTTP uh, and higher, but not lower, or not including HTTP. So they think about, you know, um, 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 representation formats for ontologies, RDF, OWL. Uh, so, you know, all different, basically different forms of payload you possibly have in those HTTP requests, right? Um, but they are not really concerned with everything that happens, you know, beyond your browser, I would say. I'm, I'm just using it very profanely. It's not entirely right. But um, so that's that's basically W3C territory. IETF is more like the Inter -Engin Internet Engineering Task Force. So the name has some meaning here. They are more interested in uh, transport protocol, uh, communication protocols, and stuff like that, right? So they are, from the information technology side, the kind of um, the protocol specifiers. For example, your email protocol, what's that called? What's the email protocol we're using for? SMTP, SMTP right? What does that stand for? Simple mail transfer protocol. And um, this one is also, for example, standardized by the IETF, right? It's not something you interact with. You have your mail client, you press send, and that's where your interest in email gets lost, other than remembering, hopefully, your email, which happens to be easier than remembering your own telephone number, by the way. Um, but, um, so, but how this transfer actually occurs is managed or standardized by the IETF, right? And now you get to the gist of why standards are important. Why do we need standards? Right. Interoperability, right? That's the main point, right? There's limitations to standards, but there's also advantages to standards. We can you all use different devices, different endpoints, different, you know, clients, whatever else, and still communicate, right? I can, yay, send you all an email, even though I'm not a big fan of it, I nevertheless can, right? So I'm not saying I don't want to email you, I'm just saying I prefer issue tracking. Anyway, so, but you get the gist as well. But you can also all access GitLab, irrespective of your particular browsers, because you use a standardized protocol to access it. And we don't care if you're using Mac, Windows, or Linux, or whatever else you are on the planet, really, right? So um, that's quite quite straightforward. Uh, are there any other standardization committees you want to know or learn about, historically more important ones? Uh, we get Unix is a special case. Unix has an element that's, um, as far as I recall, ISO standard, DICE. What does ISO stand for? That's an easy one, actually. Where's that coming from? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I saw it, it's, isn't it a usable set of dates? It's also the date standard? Yeah, 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 you're getting there. So they standardize like everything on the planet, right? That is time zones, that is dates, date formats, country codes. The TLDs, the internet domains, are actually derived from the ISO codes to some extent. No, it's basically the International Standardization Organization. That's like the, 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 the thing 
the, the goal of Goliath of standardization in a way. But now we're more narrowly looking out into our you know, techy stuff. So um, they, they mess around a bit there as well. For example, they standardize C++, uh, different editions of C++. They're standardized by ISO. So you have different implementations of them by you know, Microsoft compilers and whatever else compilers. But uh, they all work based on certain standards that they commit to or not. But that's beyond the point because we're not doing programming right now or operating systems which would also be uh, under the ISO in many instances, but uh, communication. So ITF, W3C, ITU, anyone? International Tr uh, Telecommunications Union, it's ridiculous. They are the guys that standardize telephone numbers. <laughs> so that's why you know you're plus four seven in front uh, when you call to Norway or in a zero, zero, one if you, or plus one if you call to US for example, for example right? So, so different standardization organizations have different responsibilities to standardize different things. It's not just one giant umbrella that you know, controls the world and uh, uh, all the standards that we uh, um, uh, include. But for you, you want to remember um, uh, the IETF is an important one on the infrastructure side, communication side, and then the W3C on the uh, you know, front end side, I would say. Really bluntly, if you look at their standards, they're overlapping, but they're basically those two main organizations. The other one you want to know about is ICANN as well. What, does, what do they do? ICANN. If you read news in the beginning of 2020, there was one of the important non corona news in 2020. Um, you may have come across those guys. ICANN, anyone? So they are responsible for the, um, the, the assignment of ports, for example, talk about these ports, right, 80, 80, 80, 403 and so on, uh, and also domains, right, so um, they manage those ones, so um, they are kind of the umbrella that holds the IANA and there's the internet, the assigned authority for assigned names and numbers or something like this, and they basically manage like, you know, who owns a particular domain, .org domain was an issue there, I'm not sure if anyone recall it. Uh, so the dog odd domain, one of the foundational domains of the internet, basically was meant to be sold off to Ethos Capital, which is a kind of a private uh, hedge fund kind of thing. They want to make money of it, but it's by hiking and raising the prices, right? But dot org has a very high reputation on the internet, right? So if you have a dot org in the end, it sounds like you know it's not bound to a particular uh, um, you know country at all. It's kind of international. It's generally associated with NGOs, the United Positivity thing, and not so much a, uh, a, a, a you know openness. Flair to it, so it was really contentious, led to big discussions, and was eventually abandoned. So, which is good. But beyond the point, the point I'm making here, there are different organizations that manage those things, and one of them is the IETF, and that's the one that's of relevance for us. So, every time you think about RFC, you can find them in many standardization committees, but the ones the IETF are the most famous ones. Internet Engineering Task Force, and um, that's that's the idea. What are RFCs? Uh, first of all, you know, exactly. Just an overview about uh, the the, the um, uh, internal engineering task force. You know, there's there's an overarching. So it's a committee of committees with committees. So if you're interested in that kind of bureaucratic structure, you you get you won't get enough of it, right? So you have an overall internet society. You have an architecture board. One of them more focusing on the uh, research side, and one more on the engineering side. And that's the left track we are in. We want to use stuff that is you know standardized, so we can actually. Uh, uh, use it systematically. So here, uh, recollection of some of the examples that just made, but don't need to memorize those. I just want to give you appreciation that there are those standardization bodies uh, that we're working with all the time. And so every time you're using a certain standard, you know, you're dealing with HTML and so on, you're likely working with one of those. Okay, requests for comments. They're kind of funny um, in a way, because they are one of the last remaining documents that are actually published in ASCII format, right? So literally, so you can read it with any endpoint machine, it doesn't make presumptions about your machine other than supporting ASCII and uh, yeah, some text format. You don't need to know about XML, HTML, let alone. So they're super plain and perhaps not super appealing either, right? So those requests, uh, comments, they have an um, incrementing serial number, but right? they're uniquely identified, quite cute actually. The only problem there is you can't memorize them. Well, you will learn to memorize some of them, I guess. And they have certain statuses over time. So they can either be informational, hey, you know, here's this thing on the internet, um, or uh, this idea, let's just talk about this, uh, kind of to, to, to put out some, uh, you know, um, information in the widest sense. Um, uh, one example is, um, for example, how to use language in RFCs is one of the RFCs that, you know, talks about how you should 
uh, indicate whether things are required, optional, or you know, forbidden in, in internet standards and so on. There's a uniform specification of the language you should use. That's an informational one. Then there's experimental ones. That is, hey, it's a new idea. Let's try it out and see if it fails or not. And that eventually becomes possibly a standard, right? So it can progress into standard. Um, and when you have an established standard that's accepted, and um, acceptance means, I think, that you need to have if I get it right, so you, Wikipedia will know better, but I think you need to have of any proposed standard two um, uh, commercial implementations in the uh, two years following the publication of the standard. Right? So the point is, if no one adopts it, it, becomes, it doesn't become a standard. Right? Someone needs to push it. Otherwise, it's not going to be a standard, it will be abandoned. And then, of course, historic ones, the ones that are actually abandoned, and the ones that focus on best practice, basically, you know, it's not so much here's new tech, but here how to use it. Right? So let's look at some of them. Um, I just want to share a bit of the intuition with you, because I think you should learn um, how to deal with those guys. And also not be shy of re oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can solve that issue, but perhaps be slightly less uh, intimidated when reading them. That's how they look like. So, yeah, posted by the IETF, and this is, you see it's plain text, basically, yeah, they got fancy, they now have PDF versions as well, you know, they're kind of moving the times, but if you look at it, it's as simple as it comes, right, they even big discussions whether they would want to, that's funny, uh, introduce HTTPS encryption, because they felt, oh, this challenges accessibility, right, because you suddenly require people to know about security. Um, so, but this is how the documents look like, so, you know, who publishes this, that's the unique identifier, um, and then it also says, you know, how it relates to other ones, talking about the hyperlink thing, you know, does it obsolete another existing standard? Does it perhaps just update it? Meaning this is still, you know, relevant, but this uh, may actually just continue, uh, contain updates uh, related to that standard, so some clarification. And then, as I mentioned just now, what kind of status it falls under? Is it just informational, experimental, best practice, or is it an actual standard or an historic one? So um, that's the idea. And on the right side, you see uh, the, the authors. And you may recognize the name already. Uh, top right, the right feeling, that's the REST guy. <laughs> um, yeah, so that who was at that time worked for Adobe. Um, I think he's some academic now. I, I don't know where he worked, but he worked for Adobe. I think also Microsoft, I think. Uh, but I don't know for heart, uh, by heart. But basically, then the content, right? So that's the entire document. And um, if you see, if you, for example, just click here, it obsoletes uh, 2145. I've seen 2145. Quickly, I just click on this. Uh, ah, on, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong button because I have the same thing. Obsoletes 2616. Then you see how oh, this is the old standard. It happens to be from 1999. The Hypertech Transfer to Call version 1.1. Still involving Tim Berners Lee as an author, but also worth reading already. He was at uh, University of California, Irvine at that stage. That's right. Um, so you see how they build up on each other. So it's obsolete bias. So this is the latest standard from 2014 ish, whatever else. And this is basically the uh, modern, I guess, the, the most recent characterization of um, of of rest. I'm bumping the wrong thing. It's not, not, not a good person. So, yes, that's the right one. So. And that's how they look like. They are laid out in page form, so you can print them possibly. And they look really reasonably straightforward. They have usually a, a contents overview and uh, provide certain, um, the term because I can't see on my screen what I'm doing, um, uh, you know, define all the different elements that are, for example, relevant in the message. Uh, and it also, this is a reasonably complex format, even though the use is very straightforward. But what's the most important point, it actually offloaders most of the specification into other RFCs. So it says, well, you know, this is the umbrella document, but actually if you were specifically interested in message syntax, then you're probably right here. But if you're interested in semantics and content, we get to that, you have a look at that document. So RFC 7231, and that's the one that I want us to look at. If you, for example, interested in authentication and security stuff or caching, you know, how that should be implemented. And this is really down to the nitty gritties, meaning if you were to write a browser, that tells you what you can do, right, in a browser for HTTP. What are you allowed to cache? What are you not allowed to cache? How does authorization or authentication actually work in, uh, you know, in, in conjunction with REST? What can you do? What can't you do? Down to that level. This is for people who write browsers, not for people who write REST APIs, right? So, but for us, this one is the relevant one. 
And so yet another one. Um, same same principle, right? So it's a standard track. It obsolete is uh, update something. Um, same authors roughly. And um, you can have a look here, basically. But the interesting thing, what I just want to get here is what it defines, and that's getting closer to what you could be interested in. In uh, section four, it looks at request methods. And that's where we get to rest the important bits. Marius, uh, in the previous lecture, briefly talked about rest methods before, or, you know, get, I guess, post and stuff, right? So the older HTTP methods as well. And that's where they define it. Here's literally where you identify, uh, um, uh, you learn, you know, what they actually do, what they mean, and what they should do as well. And for you as a developer, not of a browser, but of an API, that's important because that tells you how those could possibly um, uh, work. So if I'm clicking, for example, luckily they use hyperlinks, so that's good. Um, have certain method definition, right? So the get method re requests a transfer of the currently selected representation for the target resource. So that's kind of how, how they describe those uh, things. So you basically can get um, things and also tells you what you can do. There are certain challenges, uh, uh, what you can do with the response. For example, the response of a get request is cacheable, right? So it means you can store it uh, in, in a cache and reuse it later on. You can assume that if a user requests the same results again, you should fundamentally be able to provide this from your cache for efficiency purposes. For other methods, that's, for, for example, not allowed, right? So um, it's also cacheable here. There's the post request. So responses to post requests are only cacheable when they include explicit freshness information. Freshness information is basically timestamp. Uh, information of updates and so on. So what I want to get here is not to intimidate you, but what I want to get you to is to think about if you want to learn more about the semantics, the actual meaning, how you use one of those methods, or more than one of those methods, here's exactly here's the authoritative uh, definition of how they come about and how they're defined. And if there's a new protocol coming out tomorrow, guess what? That will be somewhere in an RFC. Yeah? So you guys, because my, my point is not to teach you what's relevant now, but to teach you how to find resources that are relevant possibly in the future and where to find those as well. And those are the different methods, right? So now if I'm going back to um, the overview, um, all right, we can iterate through here. So we have essential, the essential point is that we talked about representation of state transfer in the sense that we know the payload already, JSON, whatever, right? Doesn't matter. We always represent everything in those Payloads. But how do we do interaction? Well, we do interaction by having payload plus method, right? HTTP method, as you as you call it. And you'll uh, you have seen in the first slide that I showed you on the HTTP protocol, there was this get there, right? And this is the get method, the standard uh, method that the browser uses to retrieve resources. But there are a few other ones as well, right? So it's the get method there, which is basically saying. It give me the resource at that particular URL. I would just want everything from there. So no, no comments asked, uh, questions asked. Give me everything. So that's the usual in the CRUD world. What would it correspond to? That would be anyone? That? I lost them. They read, right? So read. You just get the information. I don't care about anything else, right? So that's right. So get is the general one you want to use. Head is um, similar. The only difference, basically, is that um, it's 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 doesn't say any pay, send any payload. You basically say give me the resource, but kind of don't give me the resource. I don't know. But basically, what you get from there is the header information. So if you just enter it in the envelope, right? So the content type is delivered at uh, uh, the server information, you know, what, 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 what server instances running and further information, um, then you can use that one. Uh, that's the head method. You will practically never use it. You as, as you use it. Then there's post. Uh, and post is really for, here's the new resource. Please post this on the server. I want you to change this on the server, right? In CRUD world, what does it correspond to? Create, right? Post is create. We get to update as well. So um, that's right. Post is meaning completely new instance of resource. Please publish this on the server. So here's, you know, if you want to, you can read all through this and see what's permissible, what's not, you know. And you see this pretty hard in terms of, look at the syntax, how they specified it. They say explicitly, 
the origin is, is of a May redirect. You see how, how clear the language is specified? And there's another document that specifies the use of the language, what it actually means. Because, of course, it's still human readable, but you want to be as precise as possible. So, uh, put is another one. Uh, you have not come across this yet anywhere, right? So, the, um, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get back to that in a bit. The put method is fundamentally a modify on the server. Right? So it assumes an existing resource, right? And it says student, student number H, not so. But you want to increase, let's say, the H by one or change the student number or whatever. But for an existing known student, so you, you have a unique identifier already, um, then you can use the put request and just say, hey, please change this field. Right? So you can actually say, this is the new representation for that existing student. Post is like, here's a completely new thing. There's nothing there yet. Please, you know, add it to your database and give me, let's say, a unique identifier back, so I know for the future how to access it, right? The put case is different and say, I know that exists already, just want to change an entity. It's two different things, right? <coughs> Depending on implementation, <laughs> there's, um, it's specified here, you can mm, app use, if you like, put also to create resources in some instances, but generally that's not desirable uh, for, for, for uh, obvious reasons, because it would uh, mess up with the semantics, the meaning, right? Semantics tend for meaning in this context. Um, so yes, a lot of nitty gritties, a lot of details, what it conflicts with, what return types it should use. That's our uh, return types, we'll get back to that in a bit. Um, okay, what's the other thing? Right, so you see, put is a big one. So put is, here's an interesting information, put is not cacheable, right? If you send a request, uh, the response should not be cached because it you know, will change every, should change, hopefully, if you do a change on the server side as well. So this information is here. Delete straightforward, right? That's the delete in um, CRUD. So it should be quite straightforward. Delete something on the domain. Um, connect is basically, yeah, those are just for uh, debugging purposes. They're just to uh, um, assess, can I establish a, relay, um, a connection to that server in the first place? No information exchange other than do I, can we connect? That's good for, ah, for which kind of exercise could this be useful? Which of the interfaces that you have, for example, um, that, or um, the, the endpoints that you need to define in your assignment, which could make use of the connect method? Or the, you know, that diag thing, diagnosis or, uh, thing. Yeah. Exactly, right? So you can use either head, for example, or that one, because it's very efficient from a, a, a um, data exchange, you know, data minimization point of view. You can do, of course, the fully flown get request, discard the body, right? But it's just a waste of resource and transmission. So that's where the connect comes in, for example, or the head. I, I tend to use the head because you get more information as well. Because this basically just means does the server connect? It does, still doesn't kind of mean whether your web service does its job and provide anything, right? So it could well be the server connects, but then your service blows up. Um, but connect is one of them. And then the other one is uh, trace. That is probably uh, options, also a good one. That's basically if you just want to learn what the server supports, right? If it supports JSON output, HTML output, or uh, XML output, or whatever, return, that's the options one. So you don't care about getting any payload, but you just want to know meta information, such as what do you support, right? So, um, and the last one is trace uh, as well. And trace is basically um, for testing also. Um, to some extent, connectivity to a server, but actually identify the route it takes to connect to a server. Um, if you guys did networking, some of you probably did. You don't know trace route. No one? It's like a tool. But what it basically does, it basically uh, um, works in the IP protocol and assesses, for example, the number of nodes that you need to uh, jump uh, across to get to your target destination. So if you enter dot, 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 Google, it's not like your machine immediately connects to a Google server, right? So it goes via certain routers, right? And this trace route or tracer protocol is the idea that it kind of identifies the number of hops and see where your routing actually goes. So you know whether you're going via Northern America or the Asian route or whatever else, right? So because there's the, uh, it, it may depend on the load and the system. So it's quite fun to kind of do that from time to time if you're interested. And that's kind of the equivalent here for HTTP, just to know where you're going on. You don't, realistically, you will not need to use any of those, but I'm making this point because I want you to learn or see uh, that we have certain uh, methods that focus more on payload, the other ones that are really on resources, and other ones that are really more concerned on the connectivity aspects, and show you that REST is actually a fully fledged protocol that also is concerned with uh, connectivity, not just representation and data, uh, you know, data content in the world, semantics and content. Okay, 
So this document does something else. Um, it also, um, now I'm going into the browsing mode here, which is super dangerous. I probably should retract to the table of contents. It does something else, and that's uh, it specifies something you are very aware of. Um, that is the status codes for HTTP as well. Yeah? They are against popular opinion not specified in Wikipedia, they're actually specified here, and Wikipedia took them from here, right? And that's not a joke, because sometimes people really think Wikipedia is the authoritative resource for internet-related stuff. Yes, they get it right, of course, because they copy from here, but please, the primary resource is here, right? So not, 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 not Wikipedia, not Facebook. Um, so, and you know, here it really goes into details and actually describes that unnecessary lengths in many instances, when you use, should use what, right? So and why is this important? Well, it's quite important because when you write your, your, your design your APIs, you sometimes get really bad APIs, right? That have a standard uh, return code. I don't know. They're just said often here. So it's a standard. If you don't know what to do and you get something wrong on the server side, people just send a 500. What does it say? Well, guess what? Internal server error. Very helpful. Thank you. Right? So, but if you go into those ones, they become much more specific, right? You get much, much higher specificity. And the same for, uh, for 400 as well. So what you want to do when you define your service, you especially define your service, that is to the client side, and something goes wrong, you want to use the right status code, but also use the most appropriate one. Because you want to appreciate that there's a large number of them actually available, right? So it's actually considerable. It's not, not terribly large, but not unsurmountably large. But if you think about it, the client errors that people can do, it's probably worthwhile to see which one is probably a uh, useful you want to uh, respond to. For example, if you had a bad request, that just means you have a you know bad formatted code, include JSON, whatever else, right? You want to send a 400, right? If something you don't have an authentication to, for example, you're sending a post with a valid payload, right? That you say, this is a new student, and it's free, please create it, but the user doesn't have the authentication. Well, guess what? You send a 403, not a 400, right? So you want to be as specific as possible. Those are usually super generic, 300. Uh, 400 and 500, but below that we find much higher specificity. And there's intent uh, by us not always to give you all the responses, so you need to sometimes figure out which is appropriate if it doesn't work, because we usually only tell you what to send when it works, <laughs> which is good and helpful, but you know it's a 200. So, um, but if um, something else, then have a look here as well. And yes, you can also look at Wikipedia, it's actually more readable in a way, but I want you to know that this is the actual authoritative resource. Right? And there's no point, you don't need to memorize the the fact that it's RFC 7231, for example, but the fact that it's in some RFC, and then you will definitely find the content, right? That's the main, main message I want to get across there. Does it make sense? Yeah. You didn't expect that, right, when coming here this morning, right? Going into a text document on the internet, like an ASCII text document, right? But here's the thing. The internet is still built on those principles and standards, right? So sometimes you just need to be willing uh, and more important, be aware that they exist. I mean, to dig in if you want to do something that's slightly outside of the box and not covered in any, you know, tutorial or provide bars as well, right? Because we leave gaps as well. Because you incrementally need to become more independent as developers, uh, you know, in fourth semester, to see, you know, uh, you know, how can I find the right information? It's, it's often, but not always, stack overflow. So, uh, but it's good to know for you um, if you are. Uh, working towards this uh, professionalism. I think I covered the things that I wanted to cover. There's, there's, of course, always more. I would actually encourage you, if you want to, just, you know, don't, don't, don't read it by heart, but to scroll through and get comfortable with this kind of um, specification, how they're laid out, what they do. And they actually, even though they don't look like it, they're reasonably friendly in terms of readability. They're kind of made for clarity of readability. It's not so bad. What does user agent stand for? Correct. It's actually the browser field, so it's also in the header files that it actually tells the server what kind of browser you're using. So if you're wondering why the, user can, the server can react to, you know, you using Safari, Chrome, or Firefox or something, that's the field they're using. So there's a lot of magic in there uh, that you can explore and exploit and see what actually header data you actually sending all the time. You can suppress it in many browsers, right? But but this is, for example, something related to privacy that may be of um, interest to you. Anyway. Um, I didn't quite as get as far as I wanted, but that is uh, perfectly fine because we are basically uh, where I wanted you to be. A next session, 
um, we want to put this bit into practice in a sense, okay, now we learned about the different methods, how do we actually use them, how do they make sense in the context of our systems, right? But what I want you to do is kind of digest this a bit and uh, think, okay, we have a, basically a CRUD equivalent, since we're doing databases right now, in the cloud world as well, right? So how do they link, what do they do? They make certain assumptions um, and, uh, you know, about the representational transfer issue in particular, the importance of URLs, that they kind of identify a resource, right? They also identify, well, well I'll show you next time, but uh, let's say we have a student endpoint here, right? Like um, host, local host 8080 slash students one. That means, you know, a student identified with one. You basically can go down to the entity level, right? If you just say student, that would basically mean give me all students, right? So the URL is also made from navigation, basically, across the database if you want it so, right? If you had to think about it like a primary key if you want it so, then you can navigate uh, that way. REST is made for a high level of transparency. And when you think about it, it's kind of a beautiful ideal, uh, but it has a shortcoming, something we talk about in the next session. Okay. A lot of issues, a lot of errors, blue screens, we had everything today. Ask your text. Um, questions? Yeah, please. Nothing yet? Good. But if you have, anyway, uh, we can continue that anyway. Next session or issue tracker, easy, please. Because likely, if you have a, ch um, or if you have a question <coughs> or comment, um, probabilistically, at least two other people have it as well. So you may not be alone, right? So, you know, if it's really, why do we need to read those IFCs or it don't make sense or, you know, I, I can't get my head around it or so on. And uh, here's the thing, of course, I will not make you read those things, right? So I just want you to know where they are. I will also not ask uh, for the IFCs in the um, uh, content or IFCs, let's say, in the exam. But you want to know, for example, how, you know, what a get does, what a post does, what a put does, what a delete does, that's what the connect and trace does, not necessarily with all details, but you know, you know it's there, right? So um, that's the kind of level I want you to look at it. One question. Please. Uh, do you put possible solutions to the program um, I need to ask Myers because he made those up. So I can just relay that question to him to see if he has uh, responses to this. It probably wouldn't hurt since they're not marked anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So yeah, that's his territory i wouldn't do it by default yes but uh, what we will uh, talk about next session is a bit um, you know how to kind of do those kind of requests because you only had one shot at it with marius roughly how rest briefly works but we'll uh, see you know what difficulties you need and um, apart from looking at the rfc perhaps you have a chance to think again about the design right i gave you like like 60 percent of the structure already but now it's your turn to kind of explore the api and see what you can do already in Go and what you can't do, because there are certain things we haven't shown you. And I want you to figure out what it is. Else, I don't need to show you. So, pressure's on. Any more questions or comments? So, um, I'll, um, I have to record this, of course, and I hope to be able to provide this. I think it recovered the, um, my, my, for my crash, so there may be two recordings, basically. I'll see if it makes sense and if it actually compiles and renders properly and put them up both. Would be a pity if not, because the first one was the probably more relevant one. But um, um, yeah, so best effort. Unfortunately, sometimes we can't control the environments. So, cool. All right. Well, um, do however you please. Do we need to check out using uh, check out, the checkout tool? No, I don't think so, right? So uh, for corona purposes, I'm thinking about the... Uh, we register your seat, we register a time slot for uh, how long we Ah, cool, cool. And that was preset to 12, right? Across there? Uh, yeah, preset to 12. Cool, okay, perfect. So you don't need to do anything. Cool, perfect. Uh, just to be safe. So, um, yeah, have a good day, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.